Doctor, explain your aims. What are you trying to do here? Our aim originally was to do research into human health, physical and mental, and to find what needs to be learnt about human work and happiness. Its official title as a friendly society is the Brazier's Park School of Integrative Social Research. Our community, by definition, was intended to be a community of unlike minds. One of the most interesting things that I've learned from a community is that it demands that you shall go on growing, and that means that you'll go on changing, so that maybe we do each other an important service in providing a shared environment in which some degree of change and growth is possible. Well, it's a community of people, and nowadays I suppose they would tend to use the word commune, but when we founded it back in 1950, they hadn't thought of using this word commune. You know, it applied to the French Revolution or to history in Italy or something like that. Nowadays, it's come into fashion, and we define a community from, as a group of people that live together and eat together, and we do it all on our own work. In order to bring out the fullness of life, really, you need interplay between unlike minds. That's really one of the things that we started from, and we've tried to, to live up to that. It, it's sometimes a bit of a strain. The more unlike minds are, the more difficult it is sometimes. There is a strange kind of slowing up of action which is necessary in a community. So I went to this travelers meeting and uh, there was one resident from here talking about braziers and in South America we don't have like uh, those kind of communities so I thought like wow like uh, this is awesome I should like go and and try because I was always doing like communitarian things during the weekends but never like living as a community you know like in a community so I thought mm, this is a good idea let's try um, so let's talk about the house. <clears throat> what, yeah. Mark, how many people would you like? Well, to I can put a team together, me, yeah. mine and down. The appeal was intentional community living, and I, I had heard about it at other intentional communities because once you start going to a few, you find that a couple of people have been to several others. There's a bit of a community of intentional communities. Before I came here and knew anything about this place, I went to see um, um, a tarot card reader. In the course of the reading, she said, ah, yes, you will live in a place which um, will be like a church, and it will have a big hill in behind the building. I thought that's interesting. A bit mad, crazy, I didn't really take it seriously. Then I'd been here about a month, and I woke up one morning and I thought, hang on, <laughs> that was strangely right. <laughs> so it was like, oh yeah, maybe it's fate. Other times I feel, well, what I say is that this place calls people in. You know, it's got its own power, its own majesty in a way. And uh, 
You sometimes feel it sort of scans the world out there and thinks, yep, I'll have that one. The official opening day of Braziers was Armistice Day 1950. It has long been described as the longest surviving secular community. It is a self-contained. But secular doesn't actually represent the mindset of Norman Glaister. He was a late Victorian, I mean, born in late Victorian times. He's very self-consciously a Darwinist as against conventional religion, but he was certainly a spiritual guy. He'd had some progressive, anyway, ideas from the time of his service in the First World War. He wanted to do what a lot of people thought we should do then, is to try and get people from different countries to come together and talk through their problems rather than just fighting. It opened in 1950 and my grandfather had German volunteers here. I mean, this is only, what, four years, five years after the end of the war. I mean, in fact, my mum's German. She was one of these uh, volunteers. And that, I think that shows, for the time, how unconventional my grandfather was. There are a number of things that have come into the Brazier's uh, ethos. One of them was the sensory method and uh, distinguishing between sensory and executive and giving sensory its say, which I think was really uh, strongly influenced by the experience of the first war. There was this um, horror of the uh, sacrifices that were being made, these enormous casualties. Uh, thousands of men being sent to their deaths by generals who didn't really know what they were doing or certainly weren't experiencing anything like what was happening. Uh, and from that was born, I think, the uh, feeling that there was a need to give the intelligent and uh, the sensitive people their chance of having a say in what was going to happen. And that carried on into the Brazers set up. We're really talking about sort of, you know, maintaining and running this place week in, week out, year by year. And so we're using it on that sort of scale. But they, these the people who lived here at the beginning of this community, felt that they were leading the way to a new kind of communication where groups can resolve conflict. The focus that finally led to the founding brazers was said to have come through the dropping of the atomic bombs. I'm on this march because I think the time has come. People of every country in the world to express their determination to resist this great menace to the future of our civilization and our mode of life. If we've got atomic bombs and human communications are as poor and ineffective on the international scale as they seem to be, this is a really horrendous danger. So that this makes our concentration on trying to work out better ways for human groups to communicate. And as part of the youth in England who are going to live in the future, I felt it was my, my responsibility to take part in any sort of demonstration which would help stop warfare, and that's why I've come here. Psychiatrists, psychologists meeting together to, you know, after the horrors of two world wars, were taking their responsibility and thinking, well, no, we must come up with suggestions and we must try and improve this. And, and they were looking for a certain quality, that's why they decided to have a community, because you can't just have a few meetings about this sort of thing, or write a few books sitting by yourself. You actually have to put people in the house and sort of enable people to live together. And they were constantly looking for the group mind. So then they suddenly have a feeling where, you know, it wasn't about their own personal input. Somehow they all shared the same notion, the same energy. And I am finding that the sort of processes they're talking about are happening here.
So yeah, that's my room, room 20. And here you were. <laughs> yeah, when I came here, first I lived outside um, the main house. I, I really like this place, so kind of peaceful most of the times and I made friends here and I like when people are coming from around the world. And when I was like younger, I thought, no, I could never live in a community. But now I'm here. I feel free. Um, most of the times, because you can choose working days, but sometimes like when guests are here, you, you need to work, especially when you're in the kitchen. To me, it feels like that I'm in a dream. Sometimes also a bit too much because last year I was also I'm um, studying for my herbal medicine course. It was just too much, yeah. I mean, I don't want to stay here forever. Um, yeah, I think life would be more difficult out there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, well, in, w elsewhere. <laughs> It's only in and through other people that we understand who we are. That's what gives us a sense of worth. What we're busy doing is divorcing ourselves from other people. So there's an idea that we ought to be talking to each other and resolving differences. We appear to outsiders to do a hell of a lot of talking. We talk, we talk a lot, but then, then again, there is a lot of action that goes on behind the scenes to some extent. Meals have to be cooked three times a day. So there's a lot to be done that can't be avoided. You can't just talk about it. And it's not as if there isn't much to do because we have got, you know, a work program. Uh, we did um, seven weddings and four festivals this year. A lot of retreats. A lot of AGMs, charities come here. Keeping the house in order and uh, cooking and cleaning um, it can, can be quite a lot of stuff. And uh, maintaining an old building, I'm constantly putting putty on windows and uh, uh, painting windows and rooms. You, know, you have to be up for this sharing. You're sharing all that wealth, really. You're sharing the value of this whole thing. There seem to be, you know, a lot of people who have more than they need. You read about these people buying houses for silly money in London and never live in them. And I think the founders of Braziers and my grandparents were right. This consumerism isn't sustainable. The idea was they were hoping that Braziers would replicate itself. So it was more about interconnected local communities making up a global village. So it's anti-globalisation in, in many respects. We're all connected. But, but we stay local. We develop for our own needs what's required for our children and, and families. Everybody has a skill that is, that is, that is used. It's all about how, how I give more than I take, basically. When you start working here, you still think in terms of your work time is equal to money time and it has a value of money. Then after a couple, I've been here for oh, just over two years and I'm feeling much more now that because you don't see the money in connection with the work, you see work as being a different kind of thing. In a sense, this is what I'm just beginning to think as more sort of post-capitalism, if there is ever going to be such a thing, people are talking about it now, where you're sharing work rather than exchanging work for money. In post-capitalism, they talk about coming together socially to, to exchange work, you know, so you work in somebody else's garden and they come and work in your garden. And so you're sort of gaining something socially and you're doing work with each other and for each other. And that's what's happening here every single day. Um, and, and that's a very rich thing. A very important principle is that it's recognising our context within the world we live in and that capitalism, competition, divorces us from nature. And people are busy massing wealth, they think they create security and certainty for, the, for at least themselves and their family, but it is an illusion. 
when Norman Glaister retired, he was involved with a political party uh, that was formed during the war called Commonwealth, which was a very, very idealistic socialist party. Commonwealth says that together we can build a new world on new principles, but only if the people are prepared to work for that world. The system under which we have to live is not only immoral, it just will not work. Common ownership is necessary because fellowship is impossible in the daily working lives of men and women while the industrial life of the community is directed from the top in the interest of profit. Big business holds the whip hand politically until the people have declared for common ownership as a whole. The squabbling nations of Europe must be united under a European federal government. By this means alone is peace likely to pres be preserved. If you wish to return to unemployment queues, want and misery, and the country increasingly run by ever-growing big business, vote Tory. That way lies fascism and war. If you are prepared to work for a new world run on principles of fellowship, vote Commonwealth. Or where no Commonwealth candidate is standing for another socialist candidate. The Commonwealth Party uh, wasn't about uh, the colonial empire, it was about literally sharing wealth and it was the idea that property should be shared. And it was actually lived out by Norman Glaister, so when he leaves this place in his will, it's um, to all people who want to come and live here as a community. It's a phenomenal thing to do. The Commonwealth Party was where Norman Glaister was accepted, and so they started practicing his process of um, sensitive, resistive. The sensory is a process, so unlike other intentional communities where they would just have a, a weekly kind of touching base meeting, uh, that's not really what we have. Sensory is quite specific. And I'm only just starting to understand what sensory is. In a sensory meeting, uh, we might have an agenda of things, which are things that anybody can write down that they would like talked about. We, we don't call it an agenda, we call it a contemplanda, because it's things that we're going to contemplate. We're not things we're going to make decisions about, which is very helpful to the subex meeting that happens later. Uh, when we have to actually make the decisions and at Subex if we're divided and we're unsure what to do we can send it back to sensory and have another go at it, you know? Well, they're not just groups, they're also personality traits. That isn't to say that everyone is categorised into one or the other. Um, but there's some, in some way, useful to know. Are you a sensory person? Are you an executive? Or sometimes we would call executives resistive people. I think I don't believe like there are people like that is one or the other. I I think like me, there are people that maybe is more executive or or more sensory. But uh, I think we can be both, to be honest. There's a dynamic between the sensory and executive. There's a tension between them because they kind of, although they're part of the same whole, they're kind of pulling in different directions. Some people criticise it, say, well, if only we resolve the tension, it would be all right. And they say, well, you know, I think you've missed the whole point. Without the tension, it doesn't exist. In terms of the human body, we've got a hard exterior and a soft interior. Part of us craves adventure, but the other part's concerned with safety. But there's a dilemma between the, the two. 
there's two sides happening, you know, where you can be both extremes. I mean, uh, uh, quite amusing, very, really amusing actually, because one of my daughters gave me a card uh, just just to put on the board here. And it was a, of a group in a, some kind of se- talking session. And um, she, she obviously felt that this was what kind of summarized Brazies a bit. And um, it was uh, the, the person facilitating the session saying to the group around the table, um, just feel free to say whatever you want to say, just as you wish to say it, that kind of thing, you know. <laughs> so the, from the other side of the table comes, fuck you. <laughs> And that was somehow summarized it for her. And I thought, well, I'm not going to argue. I'm not sure, but it's interesting. So it's almost like release. You know, you are released. But of course you're not, because if we were all released, it would be absolute chaos. You know? And it can get chaotic, you know. But this is uh, Garden Cottage. The, the, the right-hand room is now Joe's room. He used to be a resident here, but he works full time outside now. And then the green door will lead into a room on the left, which is used for volunteers. And then my place is at the back, I'll show you that. I sometimes have people to come and stay, and they, stay, they, they sleep in this room, and I sleep next door. Uh, and this is my size. I, I use this for uh, cutting grass. It's a wonderful way. It takes practice, but uh, I, I've had quite a lot of practice over many years, and uh, it's a very satisfying way of cutting grass, as long as you don't try to do too much at once. That's a picture of uh, one of my daughters and her two sons in New Zealand. And, and uh, this, this is my, my Buddha, and he has a little uh, message there. It's uh, pause for inspiration in the midst of everyday life. The four decisions, pause, step back, step aside, let inspiration guide, pause. The decision to stop in this moment. Step back, the decision to get out on my own. Step aside, the decision to invite inspiration within to help. Let inspiration guide, the decision to choose my inspired mind by accepting the wisdom of inspiration. And I thought that uh, my Buddha would be a good man to look after that little thing. Through here is is my room. These are my books, lots and lots of books. That's one of my daughters and her her son is now a young man. (laughs) I came here on the 14th of September 2009. And so uh, it's seven, it's getting on for eight years. I came from another community in Dorset and it took me a couple of years to find somewhere where they'd have me. (laughs) I was 79 at the time, not a very good candidate for a community. (laughs) I think I I was a lonely child and uh, I, uh, I read a book by R.M. Lockley and the book was called Inland Farm. You know, there was a photograph in the, in the book of, of all the people having breakfast, just as we do, on a long table, and I thought, that's how I want to live. <laughs> I, I don't spend much time up here. I uh, sleep here and when I... I get up early in the morning and, and so I often have a break during the day, but otherwise I live in the house.
some of the founders of the community were interested in uh, the camping movements that happened between the wars. Groups like um, the Order of Woodcraft Chivalry, a strange group that um, was basically Quakers who were rediscovering folklore and folk religion and they're interested in the sort of pagan gods um, and rituals within nature. And here we have a door knocker, which is, uh, which is a ram, which is a symbol of Satan in pagan culture. So the door knocker is still around from about 1950. This building was built right at the beginning of the Neo-Gothic and that literature actually em enmeshes with uh, architecture at this time. So they're not building a house to live in, they're building a fantasy. They're sort of thrilled by fear. It's like a film set, it's like a being in a play. And of course the problem with that is people's fears become real. So when you play with anything, it, you, with your imagination, it can take you a little bit further than where you thought. Or you might actually encounter the things that you are frightened of by being receptive to them. So, here's the old library. It's just stacked with all sorts of, uh, you know, sociology, psychology, psychiatry, the older stuff, Montessori on education. It's always got this social sort of aspect to it, you know, groups, the human group. All these questions on these books is what they were uh, really exploring. So here you have an introduction to organic philosophy, the perfectibility of man, the evolution of human consciousness, man in search of himself, the natural history of the mind, the imprisoned splendor. Fantastic. So those are the sort of things that they're immersing themselves in. Pain, sex and time. <laughs> There's a lot here. Oh my God. A new model of the universe, Auspensky. So they're on to Gurdjieff here. And that's, that's, I often talk to people, you know, are you looking at Gurdjieff? Because he had a community in uh, Paris, in uh, the Priore, outside Paris. Mm. And he did all sorts of dances and endurance tests, and he was interested in sleeplessness, so sleep deprivation. And he was interested in fasting for days and then having massive feasts. And if they're looking at anything like this, then they're really up for some, um, you know, challenges. There's always a sort of thread of the esoteric going on, but it's not what you would call New Age like in Findhorn. Um, it's just basically all of that research of that time put together, you know, the psychology, sociology, some esoteric strands, some pagan folklore, um, they wanted to set up their own folk religion, you know. It's the sort of thing that they wrote about. Um, so, uh, you know, a bit of absolutely everything, not ruling things out. The area that um, Norman Glaister is interested in is what would be called now sociobiology. And the idea is all about that people in groups actually form um, and behave as an organism. In the same way as the cells of the body have become increasingly specialised and differentiated, it was at least an interesting hypothesis that actual human beings could increasingly, to some degree, subsume their individuality and become primarily parts of a functioning human organism, which, um, which you could see would be a multi-mental organism, or in more popular terms, more threatening terms, it could be a group mind. 
from all we can see about evolution so far, this is on the cards as a possibility. That original statement of, of Aeon's of Lorna's, um, that has that vital word, to make conscious in ourselves the shape of the process of which we are part, in order that we may facilitate its development more effectively. That sounds like quite a good stab at describing the function of human beings in the universe, doesn't it? The obvious defining characteristic of human beings is consciousness. And you know, consciousness is the absolute raison d'etre of the setting up of braziers. We've gone beyond an animal existence to something that relies on how we relate to each other. Here's the yeah. second one. Ah, what does it say? Rest and be thankful. Okay. Oh, I, I like that one. And Braze is all about intentional like relationship and promoting the oh, gregarious yeah. habit yeah. and cooperation, oh, not right. not competition. Wait, no. But the rest of the town is what, what was last year? Yeah. It's about living a life whole that will contribute to the art of living and the science of life. So the resident community gains its legitimacy from being a social experiment. The aim was really a sociological experiment. We wanted to do research to see what really are the optimum conditions for human living, especially human health, mental and physical. At the heart of it all is how to live effectively and in a worthwhile way this life on Earth. One thing that was said at the beginning was said, if this is the right approach, but we've made a mistake, it will be self-correcting, it will correct itself. But then you look at the evidence and you say, well, it's, it's, it's only changed very little. In a social context, development is the equivalent to evolution. So we talk about developing rather than evolving. And I think we've developed very little. Because of the way Glynn managed braziers, he's developed a cultural tradition that's strong enough to keep us here until such a time, in my view, that we can start to accelerate that change that hopefully will come a point in time. I think we're still embryonic in terms of the way the analogy works. One of Alexander Trockey's statements was, how to begin at a chosen moment in a vacant house, mill, abbey, church or castle, not too far from the city of London, we shall foment a kind of cultural jam session. Out of this will evolve the prototype of our spontaneous university. And you get this event that happens here, the Sigma Weekend, where R.D. Lang shows up and Alexander Trockey 
and they're talking about some sort of cultural uh, big shift, a big change. Intellectual psychiatrists, uh, sociologists, um, writers, actors, artists, they were setting up a sort of British version of the situation that's going on in France. So some of our education events after this have, have used these terms like the spontaneous university and um, several of our discussion groups have been in this sort of nature of a jam session. John Latham, he'd built one of these scoob towers of books. Yes, this sort of hollow chimney made of books. And this was made to be burnt and it was burnt out on the on the terrace wall. That culminated in the perpetration of the notorious black spot on the drawing room wall by John Latham, you see. We've got a photograph of, photograph of how it was. At some point, very late in the evening, when these respectable people had gone to bed, um, this, this wall was, he just used it as a canvas. He'd got a terrific tube of very, very, very black spray paint. And he'd done an enormous sort of oval of black spray paint. There, this sort of point on, on the edge of the oval. He'd splayed the pages of the book out and plonked them into this plaster of Paris a sort of pre-punctuation to the black dots. This spray paint made quite a, quite a smell which gradually, gradually percolated into the house. So a few people during the night realised he'd done it. But, uh, that brief film includes the Sunday morning, Sunday morning breakfast, um, at, at which Latham, among others, is very present and he's looking like a hunted hare. He, he looks extremely, extremely jumpy and extremely nervous. It caused great distress to some of the older ladies who were part of the Brazier's community at that time. Nobody liked it, but it actually took them five years to paint over it. Yes, it was discussed in a very sensory way over at least two years, maybe three. And it was then resolved, yes, it should be taken down, even though we knew some people viewed it as a precious piece of modern art. It should have been what they wanted to do. It's, like, it's, quite, it's quite interesting, isn't it? It's like they, they would have, I'm sure, you know, certainly with R.G. Lang and the like, they would have welcomed this group. You know, this was a group that was actually really going to, you know, really meeting, doing what braces ought to, you know, the meat of the stuff the braces ought to. And yet they were altogether far too shocking. <laughs> I prefer to be on the side of edgy, fringy things of making a difference to a few people than in the establishment making no difference to anybody. Norman met Dorothy through the old Robert Class Chivalry. Dorothy already had these threads of democratic education, the Kibber Kift, all those early woodcraft movements is, is simply you, you simplify things in order to achieve a self-reliance, an inner strength, and an ability to sort of self-educate. They did work with the Griff Feared, with unemployed men. The Q camps with people with mental health problems was again about, about planned environment therapy about the group work and the self-determination within the space, but the space really mattered, the fact that they were outside. You will find the men of the first Grith Feared, or Peace Army Camp, which was launched in 1932. These camps are small, self-governing communities where young men of all classes can develop themselves, both physically and mentally. They felled trees, trimmed the logs, and with them built sleeping and dining shelters, which are in use all the year round. The temporary erections will later be replaced by cob buildings like this.
built in the traditional style of the neighborhood. They weave the cloth for their own lumber jackets on homemade looms. Classes of various kinds are held in the open by members of the community for the benefit of their colleagues. Using wood fuel and an improvised oven, they have mastered the art of cooking. But when the gong sounds for dinner, well, there's no stopping them. Griff pioneers now. Um, so I'm, I'm a warden and a trustee. Yeah, it used to be Griff feared which I think means peace camp in Old English. They'll basically live in the woods and cook in the woods and being closer to nature. We'd often get left here as, as children and our parents wouldn't be here and the same used to happen at the woods and it didn't matter because it was almost like a big family. So you, you could end up here for weeks without your parents. Yeah. A lot of freedom. I had a lot of trouble fitting in at school, for instance, because uh, for me, if you, if you were cold and there was a jacket on a peg, you'd put it, you'd borrow it. You'd put it on because you were cold and you'd bring it back and put it back on the peg later. That didn't go down very well in school. <laughs> when somebody say, they're my shoes, you say, yeah, but I'm going to give them back. This is uh, Dorothy Glaister's book. Chiron's Cave, it's an extremely um, progressive book about education. Children would be taught outside. They were interested in something called hardihood, um, and children in the middle of January were encouraged to take their clothes off and stand in the woods naked and to see how long they could stick it out. There's a photograph of them here where they're enduring the cold it's a completely voluntary exercise. Children could start or stop whenever they wanted, but they would just bear it until they were numb with cold as a sort of personal challenge to themselves. So these days that would be seen as a, a horrifically cruel thing to do with children. The point of this is that it's about endurance and developing hardihood and um, understanding your environment through the challenges that it, it throws up. When she was training teachers how to become teachers, she did something where they, which she called um, the vigil of the fire. A young adult would be encouraged to stay up all night staring at a fire and then go to work the next day without telling anybody that they'd been up all night and have a completely normal day and then go home and go to bed exhausted. So it's taking on personal challenges and um, making them your own business and your own personal development. Okay, so this is the, the walled garden, it's uh, the main part of the growing area. Um, so it's south facing so it gets a lot of sun. It doesn't have any water points in it so, so watering is quite an issue but I've tried to solve that by having, um, having made uh, two water harvesting systems. So uh, the rainwater that falls on uh, the porter cabin roof over there and the campsite shower roof uh, over there behind the wall is uh, collected and stored and then it comes through the wall into the garden, so we have two rainwater taps in the garden, which, which I'm very proud of. This garlic is just starting to peek up through the ground, and I'm waiting to see whether the, the lines are straight or not, because I asked a very inexperienced volunteer to uh, do some of the lines, and she completely forgot where she'd planted and things. It doesn't really matter if they're not in straight lines, but it looks better, and if, and if they're all wonky, then someone will think I've done it. <laughs> this is the bean tunnel. It needs a bit of a repair at the moment, but um, the idea is that beans grow up every pole and when it's time to harvest them, you can walk through. Okay. 
structures and shapes in the garden. It's called a hugel bed, so it's a, a German word for a small hill, and it's just basically burying rotten, decomposing wood in the soil to kind of uh, mimic the kind of fertility of a, of a forest floor and years of dead wood building up and decaying and things. So you can almost see it as a kind of miniature landscape, a mountain range, and uh, choose where, where you think the best uh, place for the different plants are. Some plants will, will do better on the, on the top of the ridges, where they, it's a bit drier, maybe more sun, and then other things will do better in the furrows. And it acts as a kind of sponge to, to keep the water top of the bed for longer, and obviously a great source of nutrients to improve the uh, fertility and the, and the soil structure for many years to come. There's evidence in other cultures uh, besides ours of, um, of doing this thousands of years ago. This is the edge of uh, Brazier's estate. Yeah, I like to think about this place as a, the edge of the universe, really. So the, the liminal zone between the, <laughs> the known and the unknown. So it's really nice to have this connection. And uh, sometimes I feel there is a stream of energy uh, coming from the earth and uh, through the sweat lodge and passing uh, through this uh, walk that we had just done. And they're coming, going through the house and going up. Uh, towards the sky. So welcome. Siona came in, take a look. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's very small and uh, comfy, mm, cozy. <laughs> yes, uh, just what I need really. But yeah, since I like this uh, you know, small place and in relation with the majesty of the house. Uh, it's good to create that separation. In a way, you realize other different things and uh, it's really good to have a yeah, deep connection with nature. If you are all the time there, you get absorbed easily and you don't realize the passing of time and uh, you, know, you don't have time to reflect on yourself. I think I develop a relationship with my own uh, landscape in a way, so my inner world uh, has become much more important, uh, which I think we have forgotten in this era to give value to our inner world. Well, that's my kiboki symbol. So this kiboki uh, movement uh, was born uh, in relationship with the forest school camp and the scouts, so it's parallel uh, and they have symbols. So that's my uh, owl, and this, uh, I don't know, I really, I really love it, and uh, it means a lot for me, in a way, and it's kind of symbol of uh, vision, uh, and uh, inner vision, and night vision. I, I used to kind of look at the moon uh, through this uh, little alabaster bowl, in a way you can keep the the moon, you know, inside your place, inside your space. And that's a little microcosm in the caravan, yeah. I don't know, it's a, it's a kind of humble sensation being here in a way that you are at the same level of, of, of the rest. You know, in the house it's like, okay, you have in this uh, elitarian <laughs> place and uh, you feel a bit like above, you know? I don't know, I have these sensations. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, if you're not humble and, uh, you know, understand other living beings and their, uh, you know, their, their purpose, uh, you're not, you cannot fight with nature here, yeah? or you will, I mean, nature will, <laughs> will kill you if you start to fight. I don't know, other communities define themselves like uh, the technological place, the permacultural place. Uh, Brazier's neighbor, like uh, 
has this like a name and I think on purpose we don't want to have that you know we don't want to be one, only one thing it's this thing which is wonderful about braces as well like uh, so because of that the marketing is not working very well you know it is we can't say one thing it's just like yeah we are a community and we are a struggle to to say what we are and what we are doing because uh, and mainly we can define ourselves because yeah we have this business and it's not a cooperative what we do between us it's a it's a little difficult yeah when i meet people outside um, they can have sort of preconceptions about the place. That you know, it's a bunch of hippies and not uh, not very savoury and not very not adequately right wing. We live in quite a right wing part of the world here. They they kind of have a perception of the place, you know. So they don't really ask you, you know. It's like, oh, you live there, right? But this place just laughs and says, who cares? <laughs> Does it matter? The fact is, something is going on. And it, I, in a way, there's a lot more going on here than probably has ever been recognized. And, and in a way, the place is a mystery. Just by living here is, is sustainable act because, you know, supposing all these people who live here had a house each, you know, how much resources would we need? You know, the, the commonest number of people at the dining table is 11. And in a normal house that would be a party, wouldn't it? We'd do this twice a day. <laughs> And that element, you know, now that it is, or it probably always has been, but it is so multinational now, just not, you know, not only with the volunteers, you know, here, but also with the residents, that you sort of feel, I sort of feel like I don't have to go anywhere because the world is coming to me. Not a good idea, but, you know, I would like to go somewhere, but the world comes here a lot, you know. All over the world, there are people who feel they've got a little home here, an emotional home. Um, so we've got this wide, wide, wide community. Um, and then we've got a resident community at any one time, a resident community who are, you know, take on the responsibility of continuing the, the experiment. But then there's, there's a sort of a, a wider, but not massively wide, community of people who are members or associates. Members often hold a lot of the memories. There is people living here for a long time, but it's now like two years, three years, and maybe in the past the people being like stay here for 10 years, 20 years, and that changed all the dynamic of the decisions. I just, I left the community one month ago, so it's been very difficult to me to say why. But I think as a group of residents, I was feeling that we weren't empowered. Now the most challenging thing that I found here was uh, the decision making by consensus. Because uh, like in the theory, great, the consensus, but when you have to take decisions and do something practically, and we are like round and round and round, and it's very contemplative, You, it's, it's good to know like the opinion of everyone, but I feel very frustrated about that process. Sometimes I was like about to cry, you know, after meetings I was like, please let's take a decision or, you know. Although I think I, as well I left this place because was okay, was the cycle, was uh, finished and I really enjoy this place and I come back, it's like my family, it's, uh, so. No, I have the feeling that uh, now is the time to brace us to go out, brace us being like very inside and um, like hidden and probably is now the time to go out and show the world what we've been doing here.
we are known in the media because of festivals and uh, events and other things, but not really as a community. There would be no satisfaction or sense of well-being unless it was uh, somehow shared or um, and not just uh, sharing what we can influence in other people in the world but bringing the influences of the world in and uh, see, seeing what effect that people with different approaches or different uh, dynamics have. Your perception of the world is constantly changing and constantly being revised because you in constantly new situations and people are constantly changing here but particularly as they come and go but I think you know everybody leaves a bit of their spirit here so they, everybody has an impact on, on this environment because it's in a receptive environment and it's absorbing a real environment if you're not too kind of ego focused with your consciousness then there's more chance for people to co-connect, isn't there? In, in a mutually productive and sharing way. But I think that it's a development of consciousness, maybe. Which sounds a bit grand, but I think that may be what it is. Old buildings last a lot longer than people. I mean, you look at that old house, you know, all the different people that have lived in it and the different ethoses. It's a mosaic, isn't it? Just as the house itself becomes a mosaic.